Good morning, guys. Hope all is well. Today is March 11th, Monday. Hope you guys had a great weekend. Markets are still just digesting. I don't think there's a necessarily a very big downtrend that I'm seeing in the short term. It's just that it's gone up so much in the last, let's say, 17 to 18 weeks that we've had two weeks of a little bit of a break. Um, last week, actually, it was the lowest since October. Uh, it's gone down the most since October, excuse me. So I think that that would that should just continue to be able to migrate and digest. I don't see a big pending need for the market to really go down that much, but you never know. So just be consistent and careful. Okay, one of the stocks that showed up on the radar is Braze. Now, we covered a company called Clavio, K-B-Y-O, a couple of weeks ago. I'll try and leave on the comments, a link to that video. Now, Clavio is a small and medium-sized business marketing solution with a focus on SMS and email. So if you are a Shopify customer, let's say that you are a person that has an e-commerce solution on top of Shopify and you want to be able to do marketing, literally with one click, you can start using Clavio. You can start using Clavio to be able to market your customers. You can do flows, which essentially are automated messages based on triggers. If someone comes into your website, adds an item to a cart, uh, but they don't buy, you can send them a follow-up email saying, hey, would you like to buy it or give them a discount or something like that? Or also doing campaigns. For example, you might have a Cyber Monday, Black Friday sale. You want to put together a campaign message for that. You can do that with Clavio as well. Now, that works very well for SMB customers. Most of Clavio customers do less than $50 million in revenue, and that's a big size segment overall. Clavio, if you remember from that presentation, has about 167,000 customers, now closer to about 180,000, and they just went public about six months ago, six months and a couple of weeks. So um, watch for that stock. Watch for that video. I think that's a great company to look at as well for the long term. Now, Braze, on the other hand, is focused on the larger companies, uh, and they have a similar solution. They compete with Clavio, but more on the high end. Braze is more of an enterprise solution. And unlike Clavio, Braze doesn't focus only on retail and e-commerce. They have a customer set that spans multiple different verticals. They have thousands of customers in lots of different locations, a little over 1,600 or so customers in multiple different locations. But they also focus not just on the uh, e-commerce vertical, as I mentioned. They focus on lots of different verticals. And the important difference that Braze offers, besides their segment focus, is the fact that they started with the customer, the center, and being able to do channel on top. So let me give you a quick background on this. Uh, back in the 90s and 2000s, essentially email marketing was the most used channel. So every customer had an email address, people would still just market to them via email send them notifications, email, send them flows and triggers all via email. And in the 2000s, when you started getting the iPhone, then they started to move towards text messages somewhat, but not too much. Then you had apps, they started giving you notifications. So now you had these products that started to make their solution available to send messages to your customers, keep them updated on a specific channel. So email marketing was a channel, SMS is a channel, uh, in-app messaging and notifications is a channel, cards a channel, notifications on your web browser. If you use Chrome, for example, or maybe in Edge, I don't use Edge, so I don't know. But on Chrome, you can go to a website and it might say, would you like notifications from us if something's changed? You can do that as well. Now, each of these is considered a channel in marketing terms. There are lots of products, point products that people have bought over the years for point marketing solutions. And that's the way the teams are organized as well. So you have a marketing team different from the SMS team and so on and so forth. But as a marketer, when you step back, you don't want to focus on the channel. You want to focus on the customer. And some customers, you might send hundreds of emails. They will never open it. They only open text messages. And some customers, they just hate text messages and they switch it off. But in a lot of cases, what happens is customers don't switch it off because there's so much friction to do it, either because they feel, okay, I'm not looking at it, doesn't matter to me, or they just have inertia in terms of deleting. Now, I'm the opposite. If I get one bad message, spam message, in, in or message that I didn't ask for, I immediately will shut off notifications. I'll put them on the block list. And I just don't want to get messages from them. But most customers are not like me. They don't actively prune their uh, list of messages they get from a lot of people. So even though you're sending emails as a customer, uh, sorry, as a brand, they're not getting to the customer because the customer is not opening them. So it turns out you would say, oh, actually, they seem to like SMS more. Now, when you start doing this by channel, the costs become large. 
So instead, what you want to do is you want to find out what channel the customer likes and then only market to them mostly on that channel. There might be some exceptions. For example, everybody gets an email once or twice a year during their big sales and promotion areas. But mostly, you want to target it by channel. That's what Braze does very well compared to a Salesforce, compared to a Twilio, compared to any of the other products that compete. So most of what Braze competes with is Salesforce, which is marketing cloud. Salesforce has four products. Sales cloud for Salesforce automation, service cloud for customer service and support, marketing cloud and commerce cloud. Commerce cloud is an e-commerce solution. Service cloud is for customer support, help desk, though not help desk as much, although some people may use it for that, but for services related opportunities, front office, anything front office. On the marketing cloud side, they've made a lot of acquisitions. Salesforce's own product, if you will, is just a bunch of different integrations of products that they've bought over the years, uh, from Radiant 6 for social media to a whole host of other products, uh, Eloqua and so on and so forth. So instead of being able to use multiple different products in that channel, uh, which are all silos, Braze started from the ground up with the customer in the center and building by channel each of those available solutions. So they're also in some ways called a customer data platform. You will integrate all your data. But remember, we talked about this also, the CDP specifically, we talked about Clavio. That's what customers want. If you are a brand, you wanna be able to get all of your customer data into one place so you can market to them, you can gain intelligence about them, you can get insights about your customers in a single place. Braze does that very, very well. Okay, so that's the summary of what Braze does and how it is different from a lot of solutions. Let's go into the, the details of the company itself. Now, what has changed now over the years is that customers themselves, they're expecting real-time information as opposed to one week old because they've already made a decision. You know, one of the most irritating things, most of you guys will agree with me. Let's say you went to a, a travel website, Expedia, or you went to Google Flights, or you went to Kayak, and you said, I want to fly from Seattle to San Francisco. You put that information, you're just looking at fares, and then you bought the ticket. Let's say you finished that as well. Within the next few days, I still see a lot of ads everywhere I go about, hey, do you want to fly from San Francisco to Seattle? I'm like, I've already finished that. Uh, so they want real time right now, as opposed to day old, an hour old in some cases is useless, or in a week old. And that's one big expectation that customers have. And they want interactions that are consistent across all channels. When you send me an email, when you send me a text message, when you send me a notification, when you send me a content card, I want them all to be consistent. And now the difference is becoming for, for a lot of businesses, a lot of brands, getting the customer through a great experience, having them really be wowed by the experience is important as well. Now, the other change that is happening as well, uh, these are the mega trends that are affecting marketing and marketing solutions purchase, is the collection of first party data. Now, we've already seen this in multiple different ways. A few years ago, maybe three or four years ago, Apple said, we're going to make it possible for customers, consumers, such as you and I, who use the iPhone to opt out of a lot of marketing messages and cookies that are third-party cookies and so on, which marketers use to collect the data from third-party sites to be able to market to us. So important, more important is zero-party data or first-party data. First-party data is you collect the data from what the customer gives you themselves, which means they will offer to you your email address. They might take a survey on a website and say, I like this, this, and this, and I don't like that. That is first-party data. How do you collect that data and then use it for being more specific to them is very important. Um, and then the other part of it is cross-functional collaboration, whether it is the email side or it is the SMS side, or even promotions that they offer, discounts and coupons. For example, you might send a direct mailer to a customer. All of that needs to be coordinated because the engagement with the customer needs to be consistent. And then finally, the last big trend is the use of AI and ML. I mean, there have been some, over the weekend, I read a couple of reports, uh, one of them in particular, in which Sam Altman, the founder of OpenAI, said 95%, and he, quote, paraphrased this, uh, that 95% of what we do, what marketers do with agencies such as creative, such as briefs, such as uh, copy content can be done by AI in about three to five years. So it's going to be very interesting to see when that happens. But the AI and ML solution that drives the efficiency makes it a lot more important to become more customer engaged. Those are the big trends that are driving customers. Now, what Braze believes in is that instead of worrying about a channel, which means you send an email to every one of your customers, even though only 20%, 25% of them open it. You send an SMS to 100% of your customers, even though only 10% of them open it. You send in-app notifications to every customer, 90% of them just turn off notifications. Instead of doing that, you put the customer in the center 
And then you say, do you like notifications? I'll send you notifications. When you're on my website, I might send you specific content cards. You want an email? I'll send you an email. You want text message? I can do that. So you put the customer at the center and you figure out what the channels are that they like or what channel in singular that they like and only try to focus on that channel for them. Your messages still have to be consistent. So think of it in a simple way. Instead of having an email marketing solution that needs a creative, a PRISMA solution that needs a creative, a separate in-app messaging that needs a creative, you can now have one single message that might be consistent and you blast it out to all of your channels. Okay, so the legacy solutions typically in a lot of cases, marketing cloud solutions, legacy solutions, you'll probably find is a combination of SAP and Salesforce. Those are the two leading ones, but there's a bunch of point solutions. There's a ton of small, independent, individual solutions. There's something for account-based marketing. There's something for inbound marketing. That may be HubSpot. Then you might have another solution for email marketing. Then you might have another solution for PR and AR. This is a lot of solutions. Instead of that, what they're saying is you each of these solutions focuses on a channel, email, for example, or SMS. So they don't have a single view of the customer. They don't operate very easily together. Just to give you context, Twilio, as another example, is a customer, uh, sorry, is a competitor to Braze in the segment side. Segment as a business, uh, by the way, side, side note, segment was acquired by Twilio for over $3 billion a couple of years ago during the peak of the peak of the COVID bubble. They paid a ton of money for a company that's doing about seventy to hundred million dollars in revenue. Even now, growing at about nine percent, that is just ludicrous. But Segment offers a consume customer data platform, which Clavio also does as a solution. So Twilio, Segment, and Braze compete with each other. So when Twilio also exists and so does uh, Salesforce, each of these solutions, because of the acquisitions, tend to be disparate user interfaces, disparate experiences. These solution Braze from the ground up integrated. So they actually build the solutions consistent. So what does Braze actually do? They get the data from various different solutions. They have a ton of interactive integrations that they've done with a lot of solutions, uh, whether it is your website, whether it is your marketing solutions that you might have in other places, CRM solution for Salesforce data. Uh, so first thing they do is integrate all these solutions, which is data ingestion part. You get the information and the data from all of these solutions. Then you start to put them in different buckets or classify them as they call it. Okay, this is website data. In other ways, if you want to technically look at it, this is like a data lake that they actually pull different in. Once you do that, then you can have a designer, a campaign designer or a campaign manager design. Okay, this is a campaign we're going to do. That is the orchestration part. Then the fourth part is actually personalization to the end user. And then you take the action to be able to send it. So as you look at it overall, APIs and integrations with Braze occur with a lot of different operation solutions. You can get data from many different, uh, so Segment Twilio is a competitor, but they also integrate with them to be able to get data from Segment if you want to into Braze. Because Braze not only does the segmentation and customer analytics, it also allows you to be able to take action, which is the actual campaign. Uh, by the way, a lot of solutions, some people ask me, what, what is Content Square? A lot of companies, especially in the B2B side, use content management platforms to be able to send content, whether it's a blog post, whether it is a newsletter, and so on and so forth. When they do that, they want to be able to have that integrated as well, because the interaction with the customer indicates what kind of things they like. Okay, so they have a lot of integrations on the left-hand side. You can see the different solutions, warehouse solutions, data management solutions, uh, data storage solutions. You integrate that via APIs, SDKs, et cetera, pull that into the solution. And then what you can do is you can send push messages, you can send SMS, you can send email, have all of those done in a seamless fashion. So this becomes now your customer lifecycle data management solution. I'll show you in a little bit what that looks like, but you can send uh, content cards is CC, by the way. CC is content hard, web books. Uh, I am, well, in identity and access management allows you to be able to send the right kind of solution over across to the customer on a browser itself. And web hooks, you can design notifications when the customer is within your own website, if you will. So you can use it for a lot of different things. You can use it for triggers. Very similar to Clavio when we talked about it before. Lifecycle triggers are something that the customer does. They need to be messaged and given in the right place. They've also done a lot of investments in AI. Um, again, Braze has been around since 2008. Uh, that's when the company started. And since then, they've consistently introduced and added a lot of machine learning and AI-based solutions is their claim, uh, predictive churn management, uh, event management. Uh, and they also tell you what are the data transformations that they can do to integrate AI very easily. And now they're taking it a step beyond being able to work ML and AI through their entire platform. Okay, Sage AI is their product. 
uh, that is on the AI side. It allows you to be able to create managed campaigns and also personalize. Those are the two most important things you need out of a solution such as Brace. Make it easy to be able to pull all the data in. Make it easy for me to be able to get insights. Maybe make it easy for me to be able to do the campaigns that I need. And after that, personalize. make the personalization part for the customer or the end consumer very, very easy. Um, and you can also experiment with A-B testing tools, uh, being able to see which, which journey works for the customer a little bit better. That helps you a lot more. Now, where can they grow? They have about 1,600 customers. I said a little bit more than 1,600 customers. Uh, first thing they can do, what they're focused on is how do we expand besides behind besides North America? They have clients and smaller clients, smaller footprint in those locations outside of the US and also North America, but they're growing there. Second is they tend to be mostly on strategic accounts. This is a slide that you'll find, you've seen over the last few days, whenever we talk about SaaS, they, everybody has the same damn slide. They go into different geographies, they'll go into different sizes, they'll go to different uh, roles, they'll go to different verticals, and they go to different channels. It's a standard slide. They can grow on a lot of different um, uh, vectors. Just to let you know, this is the same thing that every one of these guys does. Now, if you look at what that means, if you send more emails, they can charge you for more emails. I'll go through a pricing a little bit. If you send more mobile push, you can do that. Direct response ads, which means you are buying publisher specific uh, inventory as opposed to transactional, which is programmatic ads, which means you're saying whatever the inventory is available, put it there. So that's a big difference. We went through this when we talked about app Lovin, uh, the difference between programmatic advertising and direct response advertising. Uh, direct response advertising is you going to a website, for example, ESPN, if you're a coach, you're going to ESPN and saying, I want to buy top premium content for the next five days. And every time someone comes to the basketball, because it's March Madness, show them uh, Coke Zero or something like that. Or as opposed to programmatic, you, you really can't afford to go to hundreds of ESPNs or thousands of sporting websites and you want to do the same. Then you just go to programmatic and say every time anybody that meets, meets this demographic or they comes to this data or content associated with Mark Madness, show them Coke Zero. That's the difference between both of those. You can do that with both. Uh, broadcast email, content cards, which is within your app itself, in-app messaging itself, SMS, WhatsApp. So they allow you to be able to do it across multiple different channels, um, across a lot of different uh, customers in various different verticals. News is where they started, but they now do it across a lot of different verticals. Uh, transactional emails, promotional emails, transaction messages, et cetera, and then lifecycle, which is how do you get a customer from all the way from activation to repurchase and advocacy. Uh, and they're doing it in a lot of different regions, as we also talked about. Braze itself has a lot of partnerships, which is how they help expand their work. So primarily, Braze's go-to-market is a direct sales, direct sales customer base. On top of that, some customers would want to manage to be able, they're a SaaS company, so they can come in. You can get this up and running. You can put it on any specific cloud. They don't really care. Out of the box, they do offer a solution that allows you to be able to do this. But... Um, they allow you to be able to manage through the community overall. Technology partners for the integrations of data in and solution partners who implement and also integrate their solution with other solutions that exist in the system. How do they price? So the pricing of the solution essentially occurs by maybe messaging. How many, how much volume do you send? Do you send a lot of emails? Do you send a lot of messages? A number of users that are in your system, how many customers do you have? working with the platform, and then different applications, whether you want only the mobile app, you want in-app notifications. They also have some premium capabilities such as AI that help you manage and predictive app capabilities of data management. And finally, for fresh services, that is the least one. Professional services is the least. The subscription basis are, the subscription fees are typically on a one, one, one year contract. And as people use it, it's still a consumption model. So if you use more emails, if you send more emails, they will charge you more. If you have more users, they'll charge you more. It's not based on seat. Uh, majority of the contracts, in fact, in fact, when I saw through their uh, S1 filing a couple of years ago, all the contracts at that time, but now majority of the contracts are actually built up front annually. And then over the lifetime, when they ratable means as, the, as and when the customer uses it, then they go ahead and and recognize that revenue. Uh, they don't allow people to cancel their contract. So there's a lot more predictability in revenue. That also means if a customer is upset, you probably see that only in about a year. Um, and most of the customers have two-year dollar contracts. Uh, and they don't charge a lot in overages. Most customers seem to be staying within over. You want to be able to get customers to proactively say, hey, you're using too much. Do you want to go to the next tier as opposed to charge them an overage? This is the, the overage fee is the equivalent of the uh, not sufficient fund fees that banks charge you. So you'd never want to get to that page because it's custom enterprise customers don't like surprises. They don't want predictability. Okay, so 
When you're a customer uh, of Braze, most of them start very small. They start with one product, integrate maybe just one SMS or email, and then that's usually the pressing problem. And then they might integrate, go all the way to enterprise when they actually have a specific team named to them. They have reviews that they do with Braze on a constant basis. And they also have a lot of different support, so customer technical support requirements. So how does the integration work? Any backend data source and user database, Braze provides an API. If you are a in front end interface, they give you an SDK. And SDK, the difference between an API and an SDK, a software development kit SDK is a small little library that will go in the mobile app or the website. So you can plug that into your interf into your application literally as a library package. An API is a call that you would make remotely. That's the difference between both of those. So they provide you both of those who so integrate it seamlessly and easily. They also integrate with third-party solutions. They also integrate with databases and data warehouses to be able to pull that in. All that data comes in and comes into Braze. If you want to export that data to be able to use it for like-minded campaigns on Facebook, you can do that. You can use it for exporting into your own warehouse to be able to do reporting analytics. So Braze really, in some ways, they want you to be they want you to think of Braze as a central place for customer data, CDP, customer data platform, if you will. Uh, a lot of customers use them for different things. Uh, here's one example that I that I got to happen to be able to see. Uh, you segment your customers. Once you get all your customers in place, customer data in place, you can segment it on top of Braze, and then you can do it for different reasons, for loyalty programs, for conversion, or for engagement. Uh, so how do you segment your customers? There are a lot of different ways. I'll show some examples of what that would look like, but let's assume you're a website that provides uh, accessories for hikers and bikers and so on. So if you want to segment it, you can segment it by interest, you can segment it by age, you can segment it by demographics, you can segment it by uh, preferred interest, you can segment it by a lot of different ways. And once you've got this, then the next step is to be able to go ahead and create the individual customer profile. Uh, so for example, in this case, what they do is they can say, here's one customer, you can use this as your ideal customer, and then be able to see how many more customers like this would be. So before you have your campaign in flight, you can actually test those things. Once you do that, here's how you build the campaign. Uh, this is very, it looks a little complicated, uh, very similar to if you remember sometime back when we did the work with uh, XM, when I did a video on XM, which is now private, but uh, uh, their their user experience is very similar. Lots of lots of flowcharty ways of being able to say, okay, if this happens, if this kind of a customer comes in, go ahead and send this message via this channel versus this other segment of customer we want to do it differently. So this is what that looks like. This is what Braze's user experience looks like overall. Um, you can also do a lot of complicated things within the message. So messaging channel can be a lot of different ways, or you can also... Uh, go ahead and say, I want to be able to add this portion after this other portion and have that moving that way. So their integration capabilities, primarily they focus a lot on Salesforce customers, which I think is interesting given that they want to be able to go ahead and get a lot of Salesforce customers who use individual things. Marketing Cloud. Now, Marketing Cloud is a Salesforce thing. <laughs> I don't know why they put this here. This is just Braze saying that if you make an investment in Braze, we will work with Salesforce. We will integrate with Salesforce. But Salesforce provides marketing cloud. Don't get this chart wrong. Salesforce also has marketing cloud. Braze's solution is to compete with Salesforce on the marketing cloud side. Um, so you can take all the solutions coming in. You can also put it out. You can analyze with them. You can use it in a lot of different cases. So think of Braze on the left-hand side. So there's market, look at this. Uh, so marketing cloud, Salesforce, service cloud. Instead of saying this marketing cloud is here, they also can pull it over here. You can pull the data from here and push it back if you want to in that sense. You can use it for different mechanisms, if you will. How do they stand? As of 2023, Braze was uh, focused primarily on B2C kind of customers as opposed to B2B customers. You want to be in the middle where you can do all of them. So Drip, Mailchimp, if you see this spot, this is people doing both. But Twilio SendGrid is more on the B2C side. Braze is very close to them. If your customer is aiming at the consumers, Braze is a better solution for that than it is for B2B solutions. Uh, part out is another acquisition of a customer done by company done by Salesforce. Uh, lots of customers, as you look at it, even someone like Canva uses Braze. A lot of companies across a lot of different verticals use Braze. They are not specific only to e-commerce. Within e-commerce, there are sub-verticals as well. Um, now, still in the multi-channel marketing area, although Braze claims to be a very innovative solution, Adobe and Salesforce are still leading the pack according to Gartner, not just Gartner. If you look at Forrester on this chart, look at where Braze is. This is as of 2020. I'll show you the 2023 version as well. They were literally non-existent. I mean, there's still Oracle used a lot, Salesforce used quite a bit, Adobe quite a bit. Of course, these are 
point solutions within specific areas. And if you look at the latest solution, Braze has moved up quite a bit. This is just within CDP, customer data platforms. So these are all customer data platform related solutions. But if you look at it, they've done a good job of moving up in the food chain very, very well. So before their solution would be, a person would come in, they would take an email marketing solution, email platform, just do that, and then go on to another solution for SMS and have a bunch of point solutions. Now with Braze, you can do it all in a single place. Okay, for customer data platforms themselves, the market is going to grow to roughly about, by 2025, the intention uh, and the data that I saw is about $5 billion. So that's a fairly large market and Braze is doing only 600 million or so. Um, and if you look at the a matrix assessment, still, you look at Braze, actually they don't even appear on this. So they're still small, still trying to make a move, still trying to get from there. They're doing a bit, uh, so this was as of last quarter, about 500 million or so in revenue, growing at 33%, so good growth. 95% of their business is subscription revenue as opposed to uh, the 5%, which is services revenue. Uh, they had a loss of about 30 million, not a bad, very easily manageable, about 2000 customers right now, as opposed to 1600, which is what I told you before. The retention rate is decent at 119%, and they have roughly about 2.27, 2 trillion messages that are sent to the message. So let's summarize Brazen a little bit. It's a, it's a marketing solution. It's a customer data platform. It's primarily aimed at enterprise and large customers as opposed to Klaviyo, which is SMB. It competes with people like Twilio, SendGrid, Adobe, Marketing Cloud from Salesforce, Oracle Cloud, Marketing Cloud as well, which has acquired a bunch of other companies. And what Braze does is keeps the customer in the center, makes you a customer profile by integrating all of the different channels by which you integrate, by which you present your data to your customers, brings that into Braze. And from that, you can create campaigns and you can activate any specific channel that you want. They primarily make money by subscription fees. Customers pay for it upfront for a year. Their typical contracts are two years and it's a consumption model. So if you have more customers in your database, if you have more, send more emails or you send more messages, Braze will charge you based on that. So that's Braze in a nutshell. Now we're going to go and look into the five-step process. Let's look at that. Okay, we always start with the fundamentals first, annualized income statement. Okay, from about 100 million or so in 2019, they've grown three and a half times in four years, 2022. So 2023, they're already growing at about 30% or so. They're about 430 million trading per month. So this is about 30%, little less than 30%, 29% or so. That's a pretty good growth. Very good growth, four times growth almost in about five years. Uh, still not making money, but losing hopefully much less money. No, they're actually losing more money. Oh, this has come down, look at this. So they were growing about 30, 40. This was the peak at 2022, and now they seem to be going down. They're on the downward trajectory for losing money. That's a good sign. It's a very good sign. So almost 500 million is what they said. Trading 12 months, so the run rate is 500 million plus, but the trailing 12 months, so this is 500 million, almost 500 million. Uh, this one right now is about 439 million trailing 12 months. 33% growth, that's pretty decent. They've been consistent, 60, 50, 40, 40, then 30, 30, 30. So this is 30% growth. Seems to be the good way to be in. Gross margins are pretty high in the 70, 80% range. They've lost about 30 million, but they've brought it down. So it was growing 30 million, 38 million, went up, and now it's coming down. So that's a good sign. You should get a profitability in about two, two maybe not two quarters, but about four quarters. Do they have enough assets? Their total cash is about 500 million current assets and cash and debt is about 900 million. That's not bad, that's very manageable. Do they have enough? Yeah, they don't have enough cash flow yet to make it easy, but yeah, they have enough money in the bank to manage for it. Uh, they don't have any profits to speak of, so no pre year ratio. 11 times sales for a company with 70% gross margins. Yeah, 70% gross margins is very, very good, growing at 33%. So this is a good value. They went up. So look at this. They were going at about 11, 7.46 PE, P price to sales, sorry. And now they've gone to almost roughly about 40% up to about 11.81. So this is, it's not high. If you look at the some of the other solutions, they're a smaller company. They're about less than $10 billion, about $5 billion in market cap. So in that sense, this is a decent valuation. It's not bad at all. You look at some of these other guys, man, the other day, remember when we saw this, uh, a couple of other companies that were ridiculously priced? Um, yeah, this is much better valuation 
for a company with 70% gross margin. They're not profitable, which is probably why they're not getting the valuation. But 33% is a lot faster growth than Snowflake, which we saw last week, Zscaler, which we saw last week. They're all growing much slower, but they had 25, 26 uh, PE, PS, if you will. Uh, that's high compared to this one. Okay, how did the chart tell us on a monthly basis? And the monthly chart, uh, stage four decline, and then good consolidation. So this, I would actually draw the base. They built a good base from here, roughly to about here. Good base being built. That's the base being built. And built a good base. And you would expect that this should probably be the, um, the handle, but we shall see. And where are the support and resistances? This looks like a good point for right now on the monthly chart. And then I'm going to have a resistance over here because this seems like maybe, maybe we'll adjust it a little bit better. So where are we at from the long-term monthly chart perspective? Good base being built. This looks like a bull flag, not necessarily bull flag. This is a nice strong candle in November 23. And since then it's been basing. So you could say it's just forming a base in some senses. This is essentially just forming a base, but we shall see more when we get to it. It's flat, stage one flat, or maybe stage three flat. We don't know which one. Okay, uh, actually it's not a stage three. This actually looks like it's, yeah, this mini, in this mini weekly chart basis, you can see itself. This is stage two, strong growth up, consolidation, and this is moving down. So this is actually in a stage four on the weekly chart, just on the short-term basis. Uh, but Nothing dramatic to see that I could say, okay, this chart is bad or good or otherwise. It's actually built a good base and now it's trying its best to be able to move outside of that base. Wherever it moves out of the base, we've got to figure that out. Okay, so this is down channel, however, let's draw that out. So right now it's still going down. So that looks like the cup and the handle. You adjust it out. Let's adjust it out. I'm gonna put the cup starting here and somewhere over here or even here. And broaden the base. Yeah, that looks like the cup of the handle. So it should technically go up. Braze is a very good product, reasonable valuation, growing at 33%, strong tailwinds, 2000 customers, so this is a cup and handle as far as I can see, but right now it's still moving in the downward direction, trying to find a good uh, support system. So support system does exist 47. There's maybe some support even in the 51 range. What's the price right now? The price is 52. There's a little bit of support here. So I'm gonna put a support line here, but realistically the bigger support is really in the 47 range. And the resistance, there is resistance here. There I drew a resistance line somewhere before, but before that resistance is at 61. So if you look at it that way, this is probably, okay, so this is, it should have formed, so this is the top, this is the left. If this if this goes down, this is just within the channel. If it's gonna to try to attempt another move up. So right now, it, this candle tells me that buyers and sellers are exhausted. I would like to see a reversal here at this point, because right now it's still going down. This is a downward channel. Now the downward channel usually means, and it's exhaustion right here. So this tells me there is likelihood of reversal at this point. I'm gonna wait for a day or so. 51 seems to be the reversal. If it gets in the 51 range, it is likely going to move up again, stay within the channel most likely, get at least to the 55 zone before it attempts a breakout. Uh, most recent earnings, let's see what they say. Fourth quarter fiscal earnings, they're going to announce it on March 27th. So earnings are coming up in a little bit. Earnings are coming up in, let's see, two weeks, not even two weeks, less than two. Oh yeah, two weeks. Two weeks is when earnings are coming out. So expect by the earnings time frame to move a little bit lower. They probably do a decent earnings. I don't know, I'm just guessing because they've had consistently decent earnings. So they move down here to the 47 range. Keep an alert, I'm gonna put an alert for myself. Okay, so what do you do? You do here, you add an alert for Braze at the 4768, even if it goes up a little bit. This is another alert actually. I'm gonna have another alert in the 51 zone. Uh, 
uh, because if it comes to the 51 and hits somewhere over here, that's a good resistance point to watch and see if there's reversal. If not, it's most likely going to get by the earnings time frame. It has a very good opportunity to get to 47. It may not. My thinking is it actually reverses here, tries to stage somewhere of an up move to 55. And if it does to 55 by earnings, so this is what I would expect it to do. Let's take a pencil. I would expect it to reverse somewhere over here and then move up in this direction, at least to 55 by earnings. Does 55 by earnings after earnings, then <clears throat> depending on the earnings, which I think most likely will be good, I expect it to make another break up to the 60. That's what I'm expecting. Uh, I'm gonna watch this and I'm going to probably put an alert for me even in my system to be able to say, let me remind me of this in about two weeks and I'm gonna check in on that. Thank you very much for watching. Let me know what you think in your comments. I think this audio thing is working because most people have commented saying this audio is much louder, much better than before. But if there's anything else, let me know. In terms of moving averages, oh, we forgot that. Moving averages pointing downward. So this is definitely going down, guys. This is not going up a little bit. I'm hoping that it touches the 50, the 200-day moving average at 47. That would be ideal, but I don't think uh, it might. I think it bounces here. Realistically, that could be another possibility. The moving average says, okay, this also is breaking to the lower. Oh uh, yeah, this is definitely trying to move here first before it moves up. So I'm gonna walk that back. I'm gonna say, let's see, this is not what I wanted. I'm going back here and I'm going to, okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to most likely say this may not happen. What is going to happen is it probably moves a little bit lower. That's what this is indicating. The RSI and the MACD are indicating it probably headed for a little bit. I don't know. Maybe it bounces around the 55. I'd like it to bounce in the 51 range. If not, it goes to 47. Either ways, if this grows to the 47, that would be a great point to buy because it's near the 200-day moving average. And if you look at it before, it's not giving you a lot of chances in the 200-day moving average, uh, except if you look at it beyond a year back and move quite a bit below the wind. This was during the downturn. Everybody was beating then. So this is a very good spot for the stock. If this gets to the 47, this range, 51 to 47, it's just $4, guys. It's about 10% range. Beautiful range. For the long-term hold, this is a very good stock. I really like this. Um, it's it's at the right spot, $500 million in revenue on a run rate basis, only $5 billion in market cap. Braze is, is is going to make a set of good moves, I think. I still think 61 is very likely after earnings, which I would expect, but it could be possible that it goes anywhere, bounces off of here or goes to 47. Thank you very much. Let me know what you think.